Hi, this is Jim Blythe here with the Sea Cadets. I want to introduce you to Jeremy Almarez, and he has got a world-class story about the Navy, how it changed his life, and how it saved his life. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Hey, listen, where did you grow up? Uh, inner city Chicago on the south side of Chicago. Pretty rough area, pretty bad neighborhoods. Yeah, I know. I've been there once or twice. I don't want to go back. It, it was really – you grew up there? Yeah, and and you know, gosh, that is tough. So, you were telling me that you saw a plane landing on an aircraft carrier, and you picture. Will, picture, picture, oh, picture, and you wanted to go, and you went into the recruiting office, and then bang, you were in the Navy two days later. Uh, not not quite that fast, but pretty fast. So, uh, like I said, I grew up in Chicago, and there there were some pretty rough things going on as the nineties, and everyone knows that during that time frame. Uh, there was just a lot of bad things happening. A lot of friends who had been shot and killed, been to a lot of funerals, a lot of friends who went to jail, um, people had threatened my life, things like that. And uh, I was on a drive once, and I saw a picture in a window of an airplane landing on a carrier. And at the time, I didn't know that that was an F-14 and that the Navy owned F-14s. So I decided to pull over and walk into the recruiting office and was highly motivated to get out of Chicago. Um, talked to the recruiter and said, hey, uh, can, can you join the Air Force from here and fly those planes? Or, you know, or, 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 or is this like you guys work together? How does this work? And he kind of laughed and, and, well, come on in. I'll tell you all about this. And uh, that was a, a Tuesday. Uh, he had me take a test. I scored pretty good on the test. Uh, and, I, and he said, when, when can you go to MEPS? And I said, well, can I go tomorrow? And he goes, oh, uh, yeah. He kind of like thought about it. He's not going to arrange that. And the next day I was at MEPS. Uh, came back that following Thursday. And then Monday I was in boot camp. How about that? And you went to boot camp in Great Lakes? Great Lakes in November of 94. So I, I grew up in Chicago, and the recruiter was kind of telling me, that, oh, yeah, we have Orlando, and it'll be sunny and hot and get you out of this cold weather. And, yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> Too bad they closed down San Diego. What did you do in the Navy? You were, you were in an interesting thing because you got to fly for a while. Well, bef before I flew, um, uh, the recruiter told me that the, the people who give you a job in the Navy – are going to try and push off the most needed job in the Navy, and they're not going to look out for you to just kind of be careful of that. And he put this thought in my head. And when I went and sat in front of uh, the, the detailer who t picks jobs out, you know, I scored pretty high in the test. And he's like, oh, you could do all these jobs. And he laid everything out in front of me. And here I am thinking that these are the jobs that he needs to fill. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a little card that he had left out from the previous guy that's an undesignated airman program. It's, and that's where you go. You know, it's, it's not a bad program, but it's, if you don't score really high or you don't know what you want to do and you're a little confused, they, they kind of funnel you into these programs where you don't really have a job. They kind of fit you in needs of the Navy. You don't really go to school for anything. It's like a two-week, three-week school, and, and you're in. And so I saw that, and I said, hey, that looks pretty cool. What is that? And he goes, oh, you don't want that. Right. Oh, I don't want that. You know? <laughs> so no, I, I, I didn't want that. I probably didn't want that, but that's okay. You know, I, I, I Went in undesignated, they sent me to V2 on the USS Constellation where the uh, resting gear and catapults are, and, and I figured out really quick that I need to get out of here. And this is really hard work. These guys are working 20-hour days in some, in some cases, you know. And uh, at that point, I struck AW, got authorized to become an AW, and then they transferred me down to with, with, with the air crewmen where I got some training. Then they sent me through air crew school and sent me through the pipeline. And then I got to now, for people who don't know what an AW is, back in my day, that was anti-submarine warfare. They've changed the name multiple times, multiple times isn't it? But basically, you guys out there flying the P-3 Orion hunting subs, is that correct? Well, sit in the back seat. Not, 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 not flying, but sit in the back seat hunting submarines through sound. Uh, basically, you know, you, you drop a cylinder in the water. It unravels and has hydrophones on there, and it listens to the sound as it travels through water. Like, I'm talking to you. My sound goes straight to you. Yeah. Underwater, the microphone could be here. I could be talking, and my sound would go over the microphone, and you'd hear me, but the microphone wouldn't. Wow. Now, one of the things I think is great, you spent 10 years in the Navy? 10 years active duty, uh, and, and, and majority of that is an AW. And then you um, stepped out of the Navy. You were in the civilian world. You were in real estate. You had a great time. And everybody kept telling you, um, hey, what do you do? Well, uh, I'm a civil engineer. Well, that's a great idea, right? Well, yeah, something along those lines. So uh, my last year in the Navy, uh, they put me on shore duty. 
And unfortunately for the Navy, that gave me a lot of time to do things, and they gave me a lot of free time. And through that free time, I got my mortgage broker's license, and I started getting in heavy into real estate. And this is, you know, 2002, 2003 time frame when things were really good, the market was really hot, and anybody could make money, essentially. It was just like money was just falling from the sky in every which way you went. And so what the Navy was paying me per year, I was making per month part-time. And at that point, I was like, well, you know, I, I really enjoyed the Navy. I love being in the Navy. It, it, it's, it was a really good time for me. I didn't really want to get out, but it, it, circumstances, I mean, how could you turn away from something when there's so much money? So I got out. Uh, biggest mistake of my life. Even, my, my wife even says that to this day, that I probably shouldn't have done that, should have stayed in. I had it really good. But I got out. Uh, the market crashed. Uh, at, the, at the time, I had uh, I owned a mortgage company. I was vice president of a development company. We had a construction company, a home building franchise. I was man managing an exit realty franchise. So we had a lot of stuff going on under one roof, and we were making a lot of money. And then someone pulled the rug out from underneath us. I think that was 2008 in the subprime debacle. Yep. I was there too, and I got, I had already made a transition, seeing it coming, but nobody knew how bad it would get. I mean, it got really bad. So what happened then? Well, uh, I had made a lot of money, and we had lost a lot of money, but I still had some money left over. And during my time with the developer, uh, I would meet other developers. And I'd, I would always ask all these guys, you know, well, how'd you become a developer? Oh, I was a civil engineer. Oh, okay. And I'd ask another guy, well, how'd you become a developer? Oh, I was a civil engineer. A little light bulb went off in my head. You know, not every one of them said it. You know, I met one guy, and he's like, oh, I failed out of medical school. Okay, well. But enough people said that they were civil engineers that I decided, well, maybe this is something I need to pursue because the, the market will come back. The, it, it's not always going to be down like this, and maybe I should try to become a developer on my own and, and move forward in that, in that sense. So uh, with the money that I had left over, uh, I told my wife, well, I'm going to go back into the reserves because I've always enjoyed my time in the Navy. And, 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 you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but during that time frame, everybody was trying to get into a safe job, and the Navy wasn't taking anybody. So I, I would have I would have went back active duty in a heartbeat in a second, but they weren't taking anybody. So the only thing I could do was go into the reserves, and then volunteer to deploy immediately, which I did, and I deployed for a year to the Middle East uh, in support of uh, cargo handlers and uh, Navy Customs. So uh, during that time frame, I started going to school, and when I got back, I used the money that we had made during real estate for my wife and I to go to, back to school full time. So we went to uh, community college first and built up uh, a rapport, got really good grades, uh, got offered a lot of scholarships, uh, got the all-Texas uh, all academic team, and then I won the all-USA academic team. And one of them was top 10% in Texas, and the other one was top 10% in the country. So at that point, once I got that, a lot of the schools like UT Austin sent me an auto acceptance letter, A&M sent me an auto acceptance letter, MIT sent me a letter. Everyone was sending these letters saying, come to our school, come to our school. And I ended up uh, picking the, to finish my civil engineering degree and get the whole thing, UT Arlington, because they offered me a $20,000 scholarship per year and a three-bedroom, two-bath house on campus. And I had my wife and three kids with me at the time, so that, you know, all, uh, winner, you know. So we ended up moving up to, uh, UT, uh, up to Arlington, moving into the house on campus, and my wife and I finished our degrees within a semester of each other. That's fantastic. I have asked this question to many people, and so I'm asking you, do you think the Navy is really responsible for changing you from a tough kid on the south side of Chicago to being now a college graduate with a degree in civil engineering? And, Jeremy, I know how tough a civil engineering degree is. Most definitely in the Navy, because when I graduated high school, I had a 1.86 GPA, and that put me in the 50 percentile of Chicago. And I, my wife and I, I still laugh at this because I can show her my yearbook. My freshman year was 2,000 freshmen. My graduating senior year was 54. Wow. So you then went back in the Navy. Is that correct? From reserves, you made it to being an officer, didn't you? Well, uh, I stayed in the reserves. And once I got my degree, I figured it was a slam dunk. You know, there's not that many you know, civil engineers aren't falling from the sky. I figured, oh, the Navy will take me back, you know, as an officer in, in a heartbeat. Didn't really happen that fast. Uh, I had to apply m multiple times and did not get accepted. It was just timing. A lot of the stuff is just timing when you're applying for these special programs. Uh, I applied six times. Uh, and over the course of me applying and just living my life, 
that put me as an E6 at 22 years. So I'd been, at this point, I've been in the Navy for 22 years. I'd been denied the last time, and I'm like, well, uh, if I apply again, I'll be retired before the, <laughs> before the, the results come out. So I uh, wasn't going to apply. That sixth time, I wasn't going to do it. And I was in Birmingham, Alabama at the time, because I, here I am uh, I'm in the reserves, moving along in my military career, heading to retirement, but also on my civilian side as a civil engineer, uh, getting really well known in the industry and getting offered very, very, very high positions. And uh, one of the positions I accepted was with a company called Southland Holdings uh, for the job in Birmingham on a bridge out there. And that was the second, or I'm sorry, yeah, it's the second largest, no, it is the largest construction project in Alabama state history. And I was the assistant project manager on that job. So I was a number two guy wow. uh, on that project. Uh, and they, they actually, you know, through that, I had to move, and the company would fly me out uh, to work on Sunday night. They'd fly me to work, and on Friday, they'd fly me back here. And for two years, I flew to work, <laughs> they back and forth, and then they figured out that I knew how to do other things, and I was pretty good at other things, and then they started flying me out to different projects, like a dam in, uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers in Kentucky, some stuff. They just sent me all over. They liked the fact that they can call up and say, hey, we're having problems over here. Can we send you over there? And uh, through, through that, bringing the story kind of around, sorry, I didn't mean to go off on tangent okay. here. You're but doing great, man. but uh, through all of that, a recruiter came in and said, hey, you know, looking for people to apply for officer, officer recruiter, and someone had mentioned him that I applied five times and was denied. It's like, oh, well, let's have him, he, I guess he said, let's have him apply again. So he came looking for me and said, hey, uh, do you want to apply again? I said, no. Uh, but by the time the results come out, I'll be retired. And he was like, well, you did everything already. It's all here. Your packet's all put together. You really don't have to add anything to it other than signatures. He goes, what if I, he, he actually told me, what if I put the whole thing together for you? What if I put your whole package together for you because I need numbers and you just come and sign everything? And I was like, you know what, sir, if you, if you want to go through all of that and put all that together, go ahead. And so he did. He put the whole package together, showed up one day and signed here, 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 here. And I did that. And he turned it in and I kind of forgot about it. And my company at the time had moved me back to Texas, and I just wanted to let him know that because he was in Birmingham. And I, I you know, gave him a call, and he was like, oh, okay. And a couple days later, he calls me back and goes, hey, uh, I know the last time we talked that you had put in a retirement package. He goes, where is that right now? I go, it's about halfway through. I'm just waiting for it to come back as a final, a final retirement thing. He goes, can you call him and tell him to cancel it? And I was like, oh, are you kidding? You made it. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, yeah. you got picked up for officer. So you go from E6 to ensign, right? Yep. Yep, so I, I, I called an officer that I knew that I re respected very much uh, to come commission me. And we came in on a Monday at like 9 o'clock in the morning. And my wife and, and uh, came, my kids, and he pulled off E6, put on 01, and that was it. Wow. BC How great. <laughs> I think everybody needs to know you also got involved with Sea Cadets about 12 years ago, correct? Yep, 2010, 2011. Um, I was looking for a program for my kids as well to kind of join, and I knew about the Sea Cadets in Chicago. That it, it, Actually, when I was in high school, someone had mentioned the program to me, and I had went to one of the air shows, and they had a booth there. And I was kind of like, this is pretty cool. I wouldn't mind doing something like this. You know, this would, but when I found out what neighborhood it was in, in Chicago, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to risk my life going all the way over there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little bit dangerous, but, yeah, it's uh, around 2011. Are you retired now from the reserves? Yeah. Oh, no, you're still in the reserves? I'm active. I just active? Okay, so you're a lieutenant or lieutenant, lieutenant, JG. lieutenant JG in the reserves. Jeremy, your life story is so exciting about how you turned around your life, how the Navy changed you, and then you got to go to college. Yeah. And you then put all of these things together. Now you're a civil engineer. Unless you've worked with civil engineers, many people don't know how technical. That's usually a five-year degree program. And about five years, yeah. It's a tough deal. Well, Jeremy, thank you. And what would you say to a young man or woman who's in high school or in college, and they're thinking about, well, how do I get started in life? I don't know where to go, because you did. You said, well, what's an airman deal? I don't know where to go. What would you say to that young man or woman? Well, my, my uncle uh, was a Marine. And uh, he gave me some of the best advice I've ever gotten. He goes, the military is not for everybody, but everybody should try it at least once. 
you know, nothing says that you have to join the military and stay for 25 years like me. Uh, I'm still in, and, I'm, and I'll, I'll do another 10. I'm going to stay in until they kick me out. There's no way that, you know, when they tell me I, I got to go home, that's when I'll go home. But some people, three, four years is all they need. And, you know, as long as you keep your, your eye on the prize, you know, for me it was an education. So for someone else it may be different. But if your goal is an education and you want someone to help pay for it, you want some kind of program that will help you. Because I used the GI Bill. I, I used what's called the kicker when I, went, when I volunteered for that deployment in 2008 uh, to go to the Middle East for a year. One of the things that they offered was, hey, if you give us, I think it was uh, $1,200, We'll give you a full year, extra year of uh, money for college. And I was like, okay, no problem. So I had them deduct that money every month from my check, and that gave me a whole extra year of college, which is, I mean, in today's money, that's what, like sixteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000? A lot. A lot. You know, and, and, and that, coupled with the fact that depending on what state, like I'm, I live in Texas, but I came from Illinois, you join the military from Illinois, you get what's called the Illinois Veterans Grant. You get four free years of school in Illinois. And because I deployed from Texas to the Middle East and came back to Texas, my home of record was Texas, so that counts to get the, uh, Hazelwood. the Hazelwood Act. So there's another four free years. So I've got four years still sitting in Illinois that I haven't used. I've got four years of the Hazelwood Act that I'm going to give to my son. My oldest daughter graduated with a degree in aerospace engineering. My other one's going to graduate with a degree uh, in architecture from UT Austin. And, uh, you know, if you're going to join the military, Give it a try. Just, re just remember, you know, to take everything with a grain of salt, and everything is what you make of it. I mean, everyone's always saying the grass is always greener on the other side, well, unless you water your grass, you know. And then that's uh, <laughs> something that you could just take it to heart, take into your mind when you join the military. Keep an open mind, be positive, and good things will. The, the military just lays everything out there for you. You just have to ask for it. Not a lot of people. I bet you could be something else when you go back to your high school reunion. Oh, what do we do in the Sea Cadets? So uh, uh, one of the things that, that, that I've noticed and that other people have noticed, uh, including the CEO of this unit, is that there are, there are very few active people, active reservists or active duty, uh, that come in and help with the program. So the program is mostly civilian run with, you know, maybe some veterans and things like that. But there's a lot of people who have never been in the military helping run the program. And one of the most important things I think that I offer is, you know, with me being an active reservist right now and a CB, and prior aviation as I have a broad range of experience and how the Navy operates and what day-to-day -day activities should look like and to structure those activities for the young sea cadets. So, you know, for people who are looking to volunteer, volunteer their time that are prior, you know, are veterans or, or people who are prior military, it would really be beneficial for them to help out with the sea cadets and to volunteer their time because you can help shape and grow a lot of these young cadets and shape, shape them properly. You know, it, nothing against someone who hasn't been in the military. They're, they're eager to, you know, to help with the program, but maybe they don't have that internal knowledge that, that, that those uh, certain words we use, like instead of, you know, a scuttlebutt for, you know, water fountain, things like that. You know, being able to understand, you know, military drill, military structure, how to march, how to teach how to march, because that's not something that you just walk off the bus with. That's something that has to be, you know, even people who are taught how to march can't do it. It's really hard to do, and then if, if you've been in, in long enough, it's something you pick up and you can help train others to do. Come join Jeremy and I with the Sea Cadets as we work with young men and women to help them to have a great future just like Jeremy had and just like I had. It made all the difference in the world when I went to boot camp. I did four years. I did three trips on aircraft carriers. I got to tell you, it changed my life. It saved my life. And Jeremy, it changed your life and it saved your life. Most definitely. Most definitely. Thank you for the Sea Cadets.